So hello again to all our listeners. It's Sandy Ruxton here and I'm with Stephen Burrell as always. How are you doing Stephen? Hi Sandy, hi everybody. Yes, I'm well, thank you. And um, really looking forward to today's episode. Uh, we're delighted to welcome the renowned author, Angela Saini, to Now and Men. Angela has written an important new book called The Patriarchs, How Men Came to Rule, which was published earlier this year. Yes, Angela is an award-winning British journalist and author. She's currently based in New York and she's presented radio and TV programmes in the past and written for publications such as National Geographic and The Financial Times. Her book, The Patriarch, follows on from two other books which are critically acclaimed, Superior, The Return of Race Science, and Inferior, How Science Got Women Wrong. So welcome to Now and Men, Angela. You've collected an amazing array of evidence in your book, I have to say, which we'll come to in a minute. But before we do... um, I wonder whether you have a preferred definition of what patriarchy actually is. I mean, I guess <laughs> many would describe it as the domination of women by men in sort of in all mm-hmm. fields, economic, social, political, legal, cultural. But but how do you see it? And, and why, why is it so difficult to define it? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> and I often get asked it, I have to say, and I never have a good answer oh. because, um, as I argue in my book, I don't think, I mean, we often imagine that there's one kind of overarching monolithic patriarchy that runs all our lives that controls every aspect of everything almost conspiratorial sometimes Um, and actually when you break it down and look at how male domination or gender depression actually works in the way that states are organized and how laws are made and you know in everyday ways that we think about each other it's much more piecemeal it's kind of fractured Uh, In some parts of the world, it's much older than it is in others. Um, So I like to think of it more as there are different patriarchies and they are always evolving and changing, just like any other system of control or domination or oppression. Um, And that most often that is all being done in service of the people at the top. So it's a form of elite male domination rather than the domination uh, of all women by all men. Okay, thanks. And I wondered also about your choice of title in that you called the book The Patriarchs, How Men Come to Rule, Mm -hmm. rather than Patriarchy. So I wonder if you (laughs) just wanted to say a little bit about Uh, that choice and, you know, how you came to it. Well, I wanted to make it feel human. And I'm not talking about something abstract in this book. I'm talking about real people, real things real ways that you know this is playing out in people's lives um and like i said the way that i define patriarchies is that these are systems in that were always designed to serve the social elites the people at the very top the patriarchs they get the most benefit from all of this pretty much everybody else is disadvantaged to some degree even if they get some advantages for example men in patriarchal societies all men still get some advantages in terms of status, in terms of their position in the family, but they too are serving this big ideal that ultimately also puts them in a very narrow box and tells them in very prescriptive ways how they should be and what's appropriate for them. So um, it's only that very narrow sliver, the patriarchs at the very top, who actually ever really get the best out of mm. this system. I mean, I'm probably going to displ- display a sort of sociological basis here, <laughs> but, you know, um, in the worlds we move in, we tend to talk about patriarchy as a system, and I think you did actually just say that mm. as well. Yeah. So that's partly what was behind my question, you know, to what extent is it sort of individualised, uh, residing in, you know, in individual men at the top, uh, or is it yeah. part of a, a system more broadly? Um, well... Yeah, I mean, it is a system. It's a system of control by that's driven by the interests of those at the top. So you know, it's organised in such a way. But that doesn't mean it's not real. Mm. That doesn't mean it's not being those levers of control aren't constantly being exercised and manipulated in order to adjust to what's happening. And there's people doing that. You know, it's not happening automatically. Sure. Um, so you know. I'm not an academic, I'm a journalist, and my work as a journalist really is about bringing this back to real people and their real stories, and just to remind us that um, we don't have to feel resigned to this, even if we call it a system, and it is a system in so many ways because it 
operates through the law. It operates through the way that states function and in so many parts of our lives. But all of that is being done by real people mm. with real goals. Right. And I wanted to ask you also about what motivated you to write about this subject. I mean, how does it build on the previous work that you've done on the science of, of uh, sex and gender? Um, well, this book um, came directly out of Inferior, which was a book I published in 2017, looking at the science of sex and gender differences. So there has been obviously many centuries of work looking at the differences between men and women, particularly within Western science. And a lot of that work until relatively recently was trying to reinforce and sometimes really explicitly politically trying to reinforce this idea that a woman's place is in the home as a mother and a man's place is out in public as an intellectual and as a leader or as a hunter. And um, it was trying to debunk some of those some of those ideas but also to remind people ab about the fact that scientists are human that they live in the real world that they're affected by the societies and cultures that they grow up in and um, that affects their work and in turn what science tells us about ourselves affects how we think about who we are um, so just you know trying to get to the heart of that and remind people that the science of sex difference is not a perfectly objective science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so there was a chapter in that book on male domination. So for a long time, um, we have leaned on animal studies as a way to understand male domination in our own species. So for a long time, uh, you know, primatologists and, and uh, scientists, biologists would look to species like chimpanzees, which happen to be a, be a male dominated species, and then believe that maybe they told us something about who we were before we were human, before we were modern humans, that perhaps this was our primordial state, that we were always dominated, that men always had some power over women the way that males have power over females uh, in ch chimpanzee society. Um, and actually we know that even in chim chimpanzee society it's not a patriarchy as such it's not as you know when we say, when we use the word patriarchy this is an, this is a very old word used in the uh, invented in Europe to really describe this idea that the f the rule of the father within the nuclear family is a natural one that he has always had kind of primacy in the family that he is a natural uh, authority within the family and then that uh, if you scale it up also explains why the king is in charge of his uh, people his citizens his state and why god which was assumed to be male was then in charge of the entire universe um, and among other primates including chimpanzees that's not the way that animals usually work kin relationships so if we're talking about the family kin relationships are almost always or at least consistently organized through mothers rather than fathers and even if you have an alpha male in a community most of that power that he is exercising is over other males not just over females um, and on top of that we know that there are other primates that are not uh, male dominated bonobos are female dominated for instance and they are equally close to us in evolutionary terms as chimpanzees so in recent years, that entire story that we told ourselves about male domination has been complicated by the facts, <laughs> what, we, what we can see through science, um, and not least by what's happened politically in, our, in the world anyway, which has in turn shaped who does science, the kind of science that is done, a lot, this huge corrective happening. Um, so in this chapter, I was just reminding people that anthropologists now generally believe that we have not always been male dominated as a species that this is something that we invented male domination is a is something we have imposed on societies and the question I got from readers constantly was if it hasn't always been this way then how did it get to this <laughs> why is patriarchy so widespread if it hasn't always been this way and I didn't really have a good answer to that question because um, the literature on it is fairly slim relative to how big that question is. You would think that there would be so much written on this topic, 
So very often, even in the feminist literature, but certainly in the scientific literature, you get this just assumption made that women have always been subordinate to men or men have always had more power, including in the home. And uh, I just wanted to interrogate that question and look at what do we actually know? What does the evidence really tell us? And of course, the, comp- uh, the picture is much more complicated than that assumption suggests. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it really, I suppose, felt, Angela, while reading the book, that I suppose you were perhaps going on something of a journey yourself, uh, you know, over the course mm-hmm. of the book. Um, yeah, is that, is that, would you say that is how it felt to you, you know, while you were in the process of writing it? Yeah, absolutely. I was learning as I went along. Um, and a lot of it was revelatory to me that, you know, what I was saying, especially um, when it came to gender roles in prehistory and just the huge amount of evidence that we have, historical evidence that we have of women warriors, women hunters, um, you know, the gender picture. We, Whichever society we're in, whichever time we're in, we treat the norms of that time as though they're natural or universal. Mm. We have a tendency to do that. And actually, the further back you go into prehistory, it's not that the the gender roles we have now just become harder and harder. If anything, they feel softer and softer, mm. that there is far more diversity, variation in how people live, people experimenting with different social forms, living in so many different ways. And um, that was, you know, it was, it made me very optimistic. I didn't want this to be one of those depressing books that, catalogues how terrible things are for women I wanted people to feel more power and agency having read it and because that's how I felt when I was writing it Mm. yeah I mean on on that subject I suppose um in the book you explore the experiences of women in multiple different kind of matrilineal societies uh where they've perhaps often exercised and in some cases still do exercise considerable freedom around things like sex labor child wearing property um, so perhaps to start off with, could you explain what a matrilineal society is and why it is mm. that um, their existence in the past and the present is important? And then perhaps if you'd like to discuss a, a couple of examples perhaps of, of, of that. Yeah, Yeah. There's, there's just one illustration that I included in the book and that's a map of existing matrilineal societies. And there's so many of them. Anthropologists have documented at least 160 and they're all over the world, you know, right across the Americas, there's an entire matrilineal belt across Africa, all across Asia, and every single one of them is different. Some worship goddesses, um, some don't have really marriage in the way that we would normally in the West think understand marriage. Um, in some, uh, there are um, people live in you know big extended families. They're all very different from each other, which is exactly what we should expect. Because if you can imagine all the millions of different ways that you could organise a society, it doesn't make sense that people on different ends of the world or even neighbouring societies would necessarily invent the same things or develop the same things. The reason that patriarchies feel so similar and homogeneous even when they're in different parts of the world, is because that particular way of organising society has been deliberately exported by those in power over time and carried not just through um, empires, but also through religions and legend and narrative and stories and and lots of different ways. So that's why we get those similarities, that laws in India, for instance, around gender came to mirror laws in Europe around gender because of empire. Mm -hmm. Um, So what I was trying to do with the matrilineal societies, and matrilineal essentially means that um, property and inheritance is recognized from mother to daughter rather than from father to son. Um, What I was trying to remind people is that there is nothing natural about patriarchy, Mm -hmm. that we can design societies differently because we have and we still do. And um, so we shouldn't feel resigned to this one particular system that just happens to be very common. Mm -hmm. There are lots of social, there are lots of ways of living that have become common. Capitalism, the state, democracy, but just because they're common, we don't confuse that for being natural. And it's the same with 
male domination or, pa- or with patriarchies, just because they're common, that doesn't mean that this is a normal or natural way for us to live. Mm. Because in, in the book, you, you, you discuss how with some of these matrilineal societies, um, they were actually kind of perhaps forced to end up conforming close to the kind of patriarchal norm by perhaps colonizing powers or, or you know, because of the influence of, of colonization. Um, yeah, do you want to give any examples of that, yeah. of that perhaps? Well, the the norm was never patriarchy. Mm. It just became common, that's all. Mm. So for them, it didn't feel like a norm mm. until mm. it was imposed on yeah. them over a very long period of time. So it was, you know, it felt as strange to them to encounter patriarchy as it may feel for people to encounter matrilineal mm. if you grow up in a patri- patriarchal society. Um, and you're right, we can actually document and this is what one of the things i've tried to do in the patriarchs is document in recent history so this is within living memory Mm. how patriarchy emerged in societies that weren't patriarchal before Mm. and you can see that for instance i live in new york city but if you um go a few hours upstate into Uh, the north of the state you hit a town called Seneca Falls which is very famous because it was the site of the first women's rights convention in the United States this was in 1848 Um, but that same town Seneca Falls in 1590 was the site where Haudenosaunee or sometimes called the Iroquois women came together to demand peace among their nations in 1590 so this is centuries before the Mm. United States was even founded And the reason they were able to do that was because um, they already had so much authority. They were a matrilineal society in which women controlled agriculture, clan mothers ran government at the local level, and in fact they still do run government at the local level. Um, All history was understood through the female line, so through mothers and grandmothers. And life was believed to have started with a female ancestor or goddess, the Sky Woman. You know, so all traditions customs everything was seen through mothers rather than through fathers fathers were some somewhat you know relatively peripheral compared to patriarchal europe at that time and um when european settlers settler colonialists in the the americas encountered them they really didn't know what to think because as far as they were concerned you know, in America, in the United States, they were building the most egalitarian society on the planet. They were making a modern society around egalitarian principles that didn't have monarchies, that didn't have aristocracy. Uh, in 1848, American women were fighting for their rights um, under the slogan that this was to be modern, that if the United States wanted to be modern, then it had to extend rights to women. So they didn't know how to deal with the fact that Right among them, there were ancient societies that were already egalitarian, in which women already had so much power. Mm. Um, And the way they squared that circle, that kind of conceptual circle, was to say to themselves, well, these people are primitive. And you still see that. I still have people say to me, matrilineal societies don't matter because they're primitive. They're not civilized. So what does that matter to patriarchy in the present? The reason it matters is because... What these European settlers then did in the belief that to be patriarchal was to be civilized was to try and civilize Native Americans into patriarchy. Mm. So throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, they imposed their ideals on them. They took children away, put them in boarding schools where they taught the girls to be housewives and the boys to do agricultural work. They wouldn't trade with the women anymore. They would only trade with the men. Um, In every single respect, these societies were broken down and then refashioned in the image of what Europeans believe to be better and more modern and more civilized. So the reason these matrilineal, you know, the reason understanding these histories matters is because it's a reminder of how patriarchy really does spread. That if this is how it happened within living memory, then we can be sure that this is how it happened in the past. Yeah, it's an incredible uh, story that you're telling there, really. And I'm just to reinforce your point. Um, you, you highlight how the women's rights advocates really were challenging the 1776 Declaration of Independence, 
you know, and the statement uh, in there about, you know, we hold self-evident truths about all men being created equal. This is what they thought they were challenging. And and actually, as you've explained, there was quite a lot behind that before that, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, which which went unnoticed, unsaid. So uh, so that's an extraordinary story, really. Um, But I wanted to ask you a bit more about the use of archaeological and anthropological and, and DNA evidence in your book, I mean, because really, I mean, that's one of the huge strengths of it is, that, is the, the delving that you've been able to do. And you highlight, for example, the very important work of uh, a Lithuanian archaeologist called Marika Kimbutas. I, I, I may be pronouncing that wrong, but she <laughs> argued that there may have been matrilineal societies in old Europe and parts of Asia, which were subsequently overrun by a, a patrilineal warrior Kurgan culture from the steppes between, say, th- 3,000 and 6,000 years ago. Uh, in other mm-hmm. words, there may have been a key turning point which marks the, marked the start of, of male domination, if, I, if I've got that right. But, but why was her work discredited for so many years, and why has it been resurrected more recently? It's a complex story, um, Maria Gimbutas' one, because, um, so I'll start from the beginning. So uh, Gimbutas' work itself, her theory, owes a lot to that 19th century idea that uh, matriarchy was primitive, that we were all matriarchal once, and that patriarchy is like a modern phenomenon and a product of civilization, or a product of change anyway, of cultural change. Um, but what she did um, was she married the folklore and mythology of Lithuania, where she was from, in which there were lots of, there are lots of these myths of, you know, powerful women, women kind of witches and goddesses and, you know, mythical beings um, with the archaeological data, which from prehistory, the Neolithic uh, around that time, is full of female figurines. There's just no denying it. There's so many female figurines from, you know, ancient Mesopotamia, Assyria, and prior to that. We have so many of them, and in huge variety as well. So it's not as though women are depicted in just one way, but in lots of different ways. And she took all of this archaeological data from what she called Old Europe. So this is Europe, as she described it, in prehistory before the way we understand it after antiquity. And she built this theory that uh, old Europe was matriarchal, or if not matriarchal, then at least female-centered, that it was all female-focused and everybody worshipped a great goddess. And she saw evidence of that goddess everywhere. And this was part of the problem with her work is that archaeologists, men and women archaeologists, became very skeptical of this version of events because, number one, um she read a lot into there was there was a lot of speculation mm. on her part <laughs> about what things meant you know she would see the symbol v and interpret that as a symbol of womanhood that you know everything everything became a symbol of the great goddess <laughs> in some in one way or another um so it became very difficult i think for some scholars to take her seriously which is a problem in as much as not that then not it's not perfectly legitimate to criti- criticize somebody's work if you feel that they're speculating too much but men speculate too male archaeologists have done plenty of speculation about <laughs> about male dominated societies it's completely unfounded and has no basis in evidence but they don't they didn't get nearly as much abuse as she did i mean she was really mocked mm. by her peers by her colleagues um up until she died the other part of her theory was that old europe changed when invaders from the steppes came in and these were kind of patriarchal warrior people who changed the culture of Mm. Europe and then made it patriarchal. Now what has happened since she passed away is that um, genetic evidence, so we have wonderful data now from ancient DNA, Mm. it's a people describe it as a revolution, geneticists and archaeologists, because now we're able to analyze the genomes a very, very old species, even Neanderthals, which means that we can track to some degree, because we don't have that many 
remains, human mm. remains. So it's a, there's a limit to how much it can reasonably tell us. But to some degree, we can start to look at where people lived and how they're related to people later on genetically, if there is you know, family relationships there, that kind of thing. And what this genetic evidence has revealed is that it is very likely that there was a large-scale movement of people from the steppes, not as early as she predicted. It came late. It happened later, but it did happen. Mm. And it happened over a long period of time. It wasn't like a big invasion or anything. It happened over very, very slowly over thousands of years. Uh, but it did happen. And this, when it's twinned with evidence of we know step cultures at that time how they buried people there was this uh you know later they would ride horses uh we know that there were male and female warriors in fact some of the earliest evidence we have of female warriors is among those step cultures so they were interested certainly we can presume or we can assume based on the limited evidence that we have that they were interested in things military or things warlike now to what degree can we use that evidence to paint the same story as computers was painting we can't be sure of that but at the very least some geneticists and archaeologists feel that there is enough there to resurrect computers's work and mm. they've turned to it in in a astounding way you know they are revisiting all of it now they're taking her very seriously mm. um I think we need to be careful on all these fronts because archaeologists and geneticists, like the rest of us, love a nice, neat story, <laughs> love these simple narratives that can explain history in a big, dramatic way. And actually, as I've just explained, um, a social change doesn't happen in a mm. big, dramatic way, usually. It happens very gradually. People don't change their minds overnight about who they are and how they want to live. It happens over time. Um, and that is certainly how it would have happened in the past. And there is good evidence to suggest that that big movement of people was not the only reason why Europe became more patriarchal over time, that there were other forces acting even earlier uh, that changed social norms mm. and the way that people lived. Um, but certainly I find that story about Gambutas so fascinating. You know, I spoke to... One of her very close friends who finished her final work after her death, her final book that was published after her death. Um, and, you know, she was delighted that people <laughs> were coming back to her work and rediscovering it again. But like I said, I, you know, as a journalist, at least, I keep a slightly sceptical hat on all the time <laughs> because um, whenever people pretend that big social change happens in a very simple way, uh, I find that very hard to believe. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the uh, powerful things in the book, I think, is is how you highlight, you know, how perhaps, as somebody who works in academia myself, perhaps how scientists might often be coming into their research with certain assumptions, right? And um, and perhaps that is something which, mm. as you said, like, Kimbutas was was criticised for that, but at the, but yeah, probably many scientists, especially male scientists, have probably been making assumptions about all sorts of evidence from the past assuming that this was a representation of men or of a patriarchal society when actually, yeah, it's like, where is the evidence for that? But yeah, another thing which I think is really interesting in the book is, um, is I suppose, how you illustrate how central the kind of the dominance of patriarchal power across the globe, that, that Western colonialism was perhaps really central to that and how sexism and racism were kind of often overlapping there. And yeah, that perhaps a, a, a lot of the roots of, you know, quite a lot of the patriarchal thinking which we have um, in many Western countries today, for example, perhaps emerged from like ancient Greece, ancient Rome, which were, which you say in the book were perhaps the most hierarchical societies which had ever existed uh, to that point, and which people still today will often point to as being the kind of birthplaces of like Western civilization and democracy and things like that. Um, yeah, so I just found this really interesting. And um, so could you perhaps explain a little bit further how you see it, uh, you know, the links between colonialism and, and patriarchy and why these things are so intertwined yeah well when i say that empires helped spread patriarchies around the world um i don't just mean european empires that many empires predating the europeans mm, as well mm. and and the reason for that is should be obvious for the same reason that slavery became so widespread or 
um, class or the idea of monarchy or aristocracy became so widespread is because it offers so many benefits to those at the top. You know, you, you are creating essentially populations of people that will work for free, that will produce more children than would otherwise be produced in a hunter-gatherer society or in a different or a state organized in a different way. Um, you know, it gives benefits to those at the top. And, you know, what I found interesting is the way that we use history to justify the societies that we build. Modern states, for modern European states, just to take an example, um, when they were created, when they developed their laws, they could have looked to so many different parts of history and so many different parts of the world for inspiration. Why did they draw on antiquity, ancient Greece and Rome in particular? Um, and it's hard not to imagine it's because, not just because we have a lot of texts and literature from that time, and it's very rich, you know, the historical data from there is is very rich. And there is a good reason to look up to ancient Greek and Roman philosophers, of course. But these were also horribly skewed societies, like really weirdly misogynistic, class-based, slave-based, even for their time, even in their own time. For example, ancient Athens was considered weird <laughs> because it was so riven with anxiety and so... You know, you only have to read ancient Greek literature to see that this constant seething suspicion of women, this hatred of women that comes out. If you read Hesiod, you know, Pandora's box is essentially a story about how evil women are <laughs> and how dangerous they can be. Um, why would you draw on that particular time when you're building a modern state? Why not ancient Egypt, for instance, and mm. a, you know, a time in which exactly the same period of time, slightly different part of the world, in which women do have a lot of power. You have women pharaohs and you have women working in all the professions and being doctors in very high, you know, held in very high regard, having authority. Why would you then pick ancient Athens? Or why not Sparta? Why not model your society on neighboring Sparta in which, you know, girls are expected, girls get married later, they are relatively more free you know they dress in relatively more skimpy clothes they are tanned they are fit they are sporty women have quite a lot of uh, authority because they own property why then ancient Athens mm. and I think it's because when we are creating societies or when people are creating societies those in power need to justify the power that they have or that they are trying to consolidate for themselves so of course they're going to draw for inspiration on societies that also have that skewed system of power. There's no interest in, you know, a king drawing on some kind of socialist utopia in order to make the case for his state. He's going to draw on the most unequal society possible. Uh, and that's essentially what we've done, that we've built this myth that there is an unbroken line from antiquity to modern European states. But that's only because we've invented it that way. It's mm. because people deliberately made it that way. Um, and we've made the myth feel real to us. I, I learned Latin at school because it was assumed that, if I, you know, to be a civilised, well-educated European citizen... You need to understand the classics. Mm. You know, the classics are seminal to understanding who we are. It's only that way because we've made it that way. Mm. We could have drawn inspiration from so many other societies. We could have invented new ones, mm. but we didn't. We did it this way. And, and again, when I say we, I mean <laughs> those people in power when, who created the European states. Mm. Yeah, and so in terms of understanding how patriarchy did come to be so dominant across the globe, um, mm. You conclude that the rise of the first states was a significant turning point in this regard, where mm. perhaps gender became a really central organising principle. Um, so could mm. you explain you know, why you think this shift was so important in embedding patriarchy? Well, you know, we have lots of existing theories about how patriarchy might have come about. So there are still those out there who think that this was how it's always been, that men have always had power over women in the home um, and the evidence doesn't really tally up with that there are some who think that for instance it was agriculture that with the advent of agriculture there came property 
and men were interested in making sure that that property went to their rightful heirs and so they took control of women's sexuality. You see that even in a lot of feminist literature. Um, and again, the evidence doesn't tally up with that because we have agriculture for a really long time, plant and animal domestication, before we see any sign of gender depression in the historical record. We just don't see it. Um, so as archaeologist Ian Hodder told me, Agriculture couldn't have been the turning point. If it was, then we would see something. We would see something in the, in the historical record to show that gender relations were changing somehow or the division of labour was changing. And we genuinely don't see that. Where we do see a shift, and again, this is just in the record that we have now, so I have to caveat everything by saying that this is just based on the evidence we have now. It could be that more evidence changes the way that we look at this question but taking just a sign just a scientific approach based on the evidence that we have what can we say and that tells us that it was with the emergence of the first states for example in ancient mesopotamia that you see the first clear signs of gender depression um, so in Gerda Lerner's, the historian Gerda Lerner's book, The Creation of Patriarchy, she very beautifully details this shift that happened in ancient Mesopotamia over thousands of years, where at the beginning you have women very visible doing pretty much everything, and, le and slowly they disappear, and you know they become less and less visible in the historical record. Um, now, one possible explanation for that is that the concerns of those who were creating the first states. And if you think about it, a state is a very difficult thing to maintain naturally because you're essentially telling people you have to stay here, live here, be loyal to this society and produce a surplus for those at the top. You know, they are, they are inherently unequal uh, societies because the whole idea of a state is that you have borders, that you need to defend it, that everybody needs to be accounted for in some way. So as the uh, anthropologist James Scott has written, you can see in the record, you can see in cuneiform tablets from Assyria and Mesopotamia, the big concern of those early states was population. How do we get people to stay? How do we get them to be loyal to us? How do we get them to produce a surplus? So over time, if your big concern is population, then inevitably you are going to have to be interested in what happens in the family. So over time, and when I say over time, I mean over thousands of years, pressure begins to fall on the family to have as many children as possible. And that pressure falls hardest, obviously, on young women to give birth much more frequently than they would otherwise, have many more children than they would otherwise, and pressure also falls on young men who can't have those children to defend the state, to be available to even die for the state if necessary. This is a lot to ask of people, but the way that glue works is through loyalty. So all your loyalty becomes to the state rather than to, your, to yourself or even to your own family. You know, parents are essentially then expected to pressure their children to get married and have children as quickly as possible. Mothers are expected to send their sons away to war, to die, in order to defend this idea of the state. And we can see that those twin concerns, birth rates and defense, are still such an important part of modern day patriarchal states. You see it everywhere. If we look to Russia, for instance, Russia, which I think is, a, is an archetypal example because under Putin, it really has become the model of, of a patriarchal state, you know, in every possible way. Putin is, is for misogynists all over the world, a kind of leader, yeah. you know, a thought leader now. <laughs> Last year, the Russian government, because of the Ukraine war, because they need more people, uh, announced that for every woman who has more than 10 children, she would be given a state honour known as the Mother Heroine Medal. So that gendered concern, this idea of linking your role as a woman with motherhood and linked very much directly to your service to the state in terms of how many children you have. 
You can see vividly, even in 2023, right now in Russia, um, just recently, and I wrote a piece about this for the Financial Times just earlier this year, uh, the government, the Russian government, because there are so many young men fleeing the country because they don't want to be conscripted into the war effort, they don't want to fight. Again, the patriarchal state doesn't care if, you're, if you want to fight or not. They don't care if you're able to. Mm -hmm. You have to do your duty by the state. And they have put out this advertising campaign that essentially said, be a man. If you want to be a man, then you need to join the army, enlist and, and fight for Russia. Um, so there very clearly, but you can see echoes of that all over the world, mm -hmm. in every single country mm -hmm. around the world, this concern with birth rates, this concern with defense. These are the linchpins of the patriarchal mm -hmm. state. And rather than thinking about patriarchy as beginning in the family, which is how in the 17th century it was framed, that you know the father's natural role is at the head of his family, that is not what the historical record tells us. What it says instead is that patriarchy started with those at the top and it was imposed on the family. It dictated family roles and it dictated that kind of very rigid gender binary that now sticks us in these tiny little boxes that says women are mothers and men are fighters. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting um, what you're saying that... Uh, you know, sometimes women can become strong supporters of, of patriarchal relations. You give the example of uh, Phyllis Schlafly in the US, you know, uh, mm -hmm. arguing against the Equal Rights Amendment, um, you know, and there are other ex um, examples in, in your book as well. But at the same time, there are women who resist this kind of um, male domination. And you just mentioned the example there of, of men who don't want to conform to patriarchal norms about being warriors or uncaring or mm -hmm. unemotional. You know, so it's a very sort of complex and nuanced picture of, of you know, assimilation, but also resistance as well, isn't it? Mm. It is. And, and we should be able to understand why people make the choices that they do. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to those who align themselves with the power of the time you know um resisting is sometimes a harder thing obviously mm. because you're not there's no benefit to that <laughs> you know you're trying to change things um so there have always been you know people men and women who have uh tried to gain the benefits of proximity to power or the benefits of patriarchal power by following the rules and just, you know, going along with it and making sure that they don't disrupt things. But there have always been men and women who have pushed back against it. And I think you might have mentioned this earlier, but, you know, towards the end of your journey, you, you, you conclude that, um, and I'm quoting, patriarchy is a single phenomenon that doesn't really exist. There are instead, more accurately, multiple pa patriarchies. That's, that's one of the key messages from your book, isn't it? Absolutely, because I think, you know, like I said, th these ideas, these ideologies emerged um, very fitfully over a very long period of time, and they wouldn't have done this in the same way in every part of the world. So even if you look, for example, at the Mongol Empire, so this is much, this is after antiquity, this is about a thousand years ago. Um, here is a patriarchal society in which there is clearly sun preference. Um, you know, the patriarchs at the top, like Genghis Khan, Temujin, have many more wives and concubines than all, all the other men in that society. They have outsized power. And yet, even here, we see women who have incredible agency, physical strength, power. They trade, they ride horses, as well as the men, according to some accounts. Um, they are a source of fascination to outsiders because they're so physically strong, because they have to be, because they're nomads and they're traveling all the time. Um, and sometimes women in Mongol society would take the reins of power when, you know, a husband died or a son wasn't old enough yet. So there's always been negotiation and movement and cultural variation in the way that patriarchies work, in the way that they operate. Patriarchy in Iran is not the same as patriarchy in the United States. It has, there are mirrors there, there are similarities, uh, because these ideas, like I said, were exported around the world, but they are products of local environments as well, local cultures. So we have to understand them as they are. And, mm. and 
one of the other arguments I wanted to make towards the end of the book was just to remember that, you know, what, one thing I'm always suspicious of is when people look at, for example, what's happening in Afghanistan and they say that that country is going backwards as though going back, they're going back to something that is, was there before. But that's not what is happening in Afghanistan. The Taliban are recreating patriarchy for the 21st century in Afghanistan now. They are reframing it, you know, repackaging it, selling it in a fresh way to that country. There, there's not some original patriarchy that people are drawing on now. They are always moving it and changing it and adapting it and manipulating it because that is the grift-like nature of, of what we're talking about. It mm. isn't some template that we have just followed for 5,000 years. It is a uh, constantly moving things. And that's, you know, that constant moving is the reason why it's so difficult to completely overcome because it wheedles its way in mm. fresh ways into different parts of our culture. Mm. Mm. I mean, you- you, you end on quite an optimistic note, I think. I mean, you, you argue that the damage of centuries of patriarchal power can be rolled back and that societies can be remade among more, along more equal lines. But, but given, you know, the examples you've presented from Russia, from Afghanistan, I wondered how mm. you can hang on to your positive <laughs> vision of a sort of radically different world when so much seems to be in a state of flux. I mean, you know... Um, yeah. Not just Afghanistan and, and uh, Russia, but Iran, the US, um, you yeah. know, many, many areas of the world. But it's a flux that should give us hope because it's a reminder that no society lasts forever. Um, and the reason there is this push and pull all the time is because uh, as much as there are the patriarchs pushing for their way of life, uh, we are also pushing back all the time. There wouldn't be, you know, if, if we were happy to acquiesce, then we wouldn't have all this flux. We wouldn't have all this tension and fighting back. Um, I wrote that final chapter. So the final chapter of the book is about the Iranian revolution of 1979. And I wrote that before the current mm. protests happened in Iran. So it was very interesting for me to see, as I was trying to sum up the book at the end, well, actually, how now should I think about that situation that all these women and men are rising up against the state, against the Islamic mm. Republic? And it can, f- you know... On the one hand, it can feel desperate and hopeless looking at Iran and seeing how the Islamic Republic is uh, doubling down on its edicts against women. But at the same time, because of those protests last year, women are also kind of putting their fingers up at the morality police Mm -hmm. saying, well, you can tell us to wear our hijabs this way. We don't care. We're just going to do it our way. You have no rights over us anymore. So... That conflict, that tension is what gives me hope because that will never end. As long as there are people trying to push you down, there will always be people trying to push back up. That's really powerful. And, and then, yeah, I mean, I mean, one thing which we do encounter a lot, right, is, is this idea that, which you talk about in the book, that somehow like, well, there's, yeah, there's still a widespread belief that somehow subordination is somehow natural to women or that men are just inherently aggressive or dominating and, and violent. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so how how would you, you know, respond to that? Well, I don't want to completely cast aside the possibility that there are some biological elements to how we behave or there is some incipient kind of gendered or uh, incipient sex behaviours. Um, maybe there are. Uh, I mean, all the work that I've done in my previous work has suggested that if that element is there it isn't profound but but perhaps there is but what I'm trying to do with this book is say why don't you just put that to one side right now and ask what else can explain what other evidence do we have to explain the world the way it is that doesn't just rest on this fatalistic idea that this is just nature that it's always been this way (laughs) you know it's a very lazy way to explain social behavior and social change um there we have so much other evidence and we have to be able to reach out to that as well we you know this idea that we can just explain everything using biology is just ridiculous because we wouldn't be as diverse a species socially as we are if it could all be explained by 
by biology. There wouldn't be any matrilineal societies then. There wouldn't be any variation in how we live. There would be no pushing back. If, if women were just naturally subservient, then why do we have feminism at all? Why, why do we get so angry about this? Mm. Uh, we have to be able to explain that as well. Mm. Yes, and I suppose the very, as you point out in the book, the very fact that there often are these you know, punishments in place if you do defy gender norms yeah. shows that if they have to be enforced, then how could they be natural in the first place? Yeah, precisely, <laughs> yeah. Why, why do we have to go to so much trouble yeah. to contain people yeah. if they're naturally contained anyway? Yeah. <laughs> the, the last question I had was just, um, uh, yeah, we were just wondering if you if you have plans yet about where you'll go next. Uh, you know, I mean, The Patriarch is such a brilliant book. I mean, yeah, do you have any plans yet about what, what mm. you might write next or...? Um, I have some thoughts. To be honest, I've just started um, teaching. Mm. So I've never, I've always resisted <laughs> entering academia. <laughs> um, but um, I've just started teaching science writing at mm. MIT. And uh, I'm really enjoying it so much. Um, trying to kind of learn alongside my students mm. <laughs> about the w weird world that we're in. And I do a lot of work around um misinformation disinformation so i mm. i run since 2019 i've been running a group that sits under the royal institution in london called challenging pseudoscience mm. and we fund projects and we run events looking at how we can combat the enormous tide of uh, scientific bad science and scientific mm. misinformation online which actually is a real security risk when you think about it we learned that during the pandemic mm. so we were founded just before the pandemic but um you know, we learned just how dangerous it can be when uh, deliberately coordinated campaigns online mm. try to convince people um, that, for instance, taking a vaccine is dangerous for them or that if you're black, the vaccine won't work for you if it was mm. tested on white people. You know, utter nonsense. Mm. Um, and the same with climate change, conspiracies and lots of other, you know, 5G mast conspiracies, things like that. Um, we're in this Wild West online. Mm still we haven't really figured out um globally how to manage this and and control it and there are arguments on all sides around freedom of speech and access to reliable information managing the rights of children especially there are it's really complex so i'm doing a lot of work around that at the moment but I don't know the answer, <laughs> so fortunately I'm trying to educate yeah. myself. Sounds like you've got your hands full doing <laughs> with <laughs> the work yeah. that you're doing. It's but, a lot. Uh, yeah. You'll have to come back on the podcast and talk about some of the yeah. issues you just mentioned there, yeah. you know, because they're fascinating yeah. too and, and no doubt gendered and racialized, etc., cetera, et cetera. <laughs> But yeah. uh, th thank you so much for yeah. coming on the podcast um, mm. and just giving us insights into the, the, the wealth of evidence that's in your book really mm. which oh, is so fascinating so i mean really fascinating <laughs> i encourage everybody to buy it and read it and uh, be better informed about yeah. all these areas <laughs> that, that we've been talking about so thanks thanks so much angela yeah thank you oh thank you for having me it's been an absolute pleasure i appreciate it thank you so much <laughs> thank thanks. you so i was reminded uh, Stephen, of my uh Latin classes there and uh, you know just how deficient <laughs> my education was about what was going on in uh, Athens in Sparta um, you know uh, for many years I think it, it, and, and still you know these societies are held up as as models or whatever uh, uh, to follow particularly I think the Athenian one so mm. she's really sort of um, dramatically undermined my faith in in that uh, uh, reading of of history and uh, I also remember, you know, Sparta was was regarded as, in my childhood, right, as quite a sort of mm. militaristic society. Mm. You know, being Spartan, mm. being ascetic, you know, the men mm. being tough, strong, all the sort mm. of notions of masculinity that we've talked about many times on this on this show. Uh, mm. And actually, I vaguely think I vaguely remember sort of Spartan women being invisible within that. Mm. Um, mm. But there was other evidence about Spartan women in, in the book, wasn't there, Stephen? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, yeah, I mean, I find that fascinating as well, that we seem to think about ancient Greece, for example, as being this, like, birthplace of democracy. And we don't talk so much about how it was also incredibly patriarchal and hierarchical and slave-based and things like that. But but also, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I do believe in the book, 
Angela talks about how actually um, Spartan women, like on average, seem to have bigger bodies and you know stronger bodies than women from other societies. And I suppose that shows as well, doesn't it, that even in terms of when we're talking about biology, that um, it's very much shaped by society and gender norms, and that's just not that's not a one way process at all. There, yeah. I, I suppose another thing which um, which reading Angela's book and talking to her left me thinking about was like the nature of social change and how that happens. Cause she, she talked a few times in, in the interview about how, you know, social change is often quite slow and gradual, but then in the book, she does also use the example of um, the Soviet union and how actually that did lead to quite a lot of dramatic change quite quickly. And obviously it's very complex and certainly, you know, she doesn't romanticize it in any way in the book, but she does talk about how actually in some ways, at least, there were shifts towards gender equality in these Soviet societies. And, like, you know, women were much more involved in the workplace. Childcare was a lot more communitarian. Um, you know, women's role in science and engineering and technology was much more embraced. Um, and she also talks about how, actually, um, a lot of aspects of patriarchy didn't change. And that actually, yeah, even perhaps among some, you know, Marxists or communists within the Soviet Union, you know, sort of among the men might have held these kind of idealistic um, visions of a, of a utopian society. Actually, there was still a lot of, um, there was a, a reluctance to let go of a lot of aspects of patriarchy, but, but some aspects of it actually did shift quite quickly. So I suppose it shows, doesn't it, that yes, things like gender norms are very deeply embedded, are difficult to change, uh, or do take a you know, perhaps have to change over several generations that actually they can also shift quite quickly in at least some ways if if that's being um, driven by a force like the state, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the, the example of, of uh, what happened from the Soviet Union to Russia and the sort of perversion of, mm. of, of you yeah. know, ideals of equality mm. uh, was absolutely mm. fascinating. I mean, I really yeah. would just conclude by, you know, encouraging people to have a look at this book to read it um, mm. because it's got a great wealth of evidence in there. Um, mm. I guess most of it, from my perspective, is about you know the impact of patriarchy on women, mm. and um, you know from a sort of more academic point of view, perhaps you know there's, there's not so much about what the components of patriarchy might be. You know, if you compare it to, say, a more sociological text like the one um, that Bob Pease, one of our other interviewees, has written called Facing Patriarchy. Um, I mean, he talks about, you know, men's individualised identification with masculinity, men's abusive relations with women, um, men's peer group dynamics, you know, the institutional power relations that that can be patriarchal. Um, hegemonic ideologies and politics, you know, th these for him are the, all the sort of components that go to make up mm. um, what he sees as patriarchy. Although I, I actually agree with her, her phrase that, you know, we should be talking about patriarchies probably given the, yeah. the, the range of uh, mm. um, ways that, it, that it's presented itself. But uh, mm. anyway, um, that's enough from us, I think. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the show today and uh, speak to you soon. Yeah, no, and as I just agree with you, Sandy, that it's, I would just encourage everybody to read the book because I think you come away with, from it thinking that, uh, yeah, if anybody tells you that patriarchy is just inevitable or that it's always going to be here or that it's just, there's no way of changing it, I think you come away from the book uh, recognizing that's not true at all. Um, yeah, but, but as Sandy says, thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Uh, do contact us at nowamen at gmail.com if you have any questions or comments. And please subscribe if you haven't already and share it with your friends and family and colleagues. And we'll be back with another episode soon. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>